the way in which perhaps by sharing our experiences, we can begin to satisfy ourselves that the domain we journey to and from is not merely mental. And the way in which we confirm for ourselves that it is not merely mental is in the observation of uh, disturbances in this world that we call coincidental or synchronistic or something like that. Now, this is elusive, anecdotal kind of stuff, but nevertheless, there's enough of it that I think there is something there. What do I mean? What am I talking about? Well, as an example, I have lived 42 years. Only twice in my life have packages of matches burst into flame in my pocket. In each case, it was about four or five minutes before I turned somebody on to DMT. Well, now, uh, what, yes, an interesting coincidence, a uh, totally non sequitur sort of thing, but twice in my life, packages of matches have burst into flames in my pockets. It, other things, uh, many, many people who um, experiment with mushrooms report it's almost achieved anecdotal status now. Uh, the scurryings and rustlings on the periphery. And when you do mushrooms fairly frequently, you get with this to the point where you just say, oh, that's the rats in the walls, the scratcher from hyperspace, whatever it is. Because it's, uh, you know, you can't wrap your mind around it, but it's always there. And then less easily confirmed and communicated, but I'm sure we all have had this experience, is you will take a voyage into another dimension, be completely laid out on the floor for a long, long time, and then sit up. And at the moment that you sit up, the fire flares up, the logs fall through the grate, the coals burst into flame, in other words, there is a wave of regenerative activity that sweeps through the whole system. And uh, people report playing with clouds. People report that after intense experiences, their lives are haunted by synchronicity. Well, psychologists get rid of this kind of anecdotal material with all kinds of se semi-weaselly arguments, such as uh, your, your clue-sifting intellect has been shifted from the background to the foreground. So now you are paying attention to the environment, and it is giving you messages. And I'm, we all know that schizophrenics move into mental spaces where Every license plate carries a message, and uh, every headline is about them, and every conversation among the people they pass on the street is about them. But we all also know that we ourselves dabble with this, that this belief that the world is entirely independent of our minds and objective and unaware of us is the kind of science... Uh, scientific fiction in which we operate, and then the real truth that appears to our perceptions, the truth of our immediate experience, is that the, the mind is a concentric field of diminishing intensity that can draw events and circumstances far from the ranges of probability. Uh, I mean, I had, once I had the following experience, it's all anecdotal, you see. I was in a dry wash in the Negev desert, uh, and there was absolutely no food, and I was uh, 
poor traveling hippie, a hashashin and a cave dweller and a ne'er-do-well. And it was like 120 degrees outside my cave. And I was sitting in front of my cave um, smoking hash. And out through the shimmering heat, I could see this dot of a person. And as I watched them making their way through the rocks and the scrub, uh, I began to have a fantasy about this person, that they had food, that they didn't simply have food, that, that they had oysters Rockefeller packed in ice, that they had Russian caviar, that they had Belgian chocolate, that they had all of this stuff. And, you know, I hadn't had a bath in three weeks. There was barely any water in this place. And this speck made its way toward me, getting larger and larger. And finally, it turned into this guy I barely knew, a fellow lost soul. This was in southern Israel 25 years ago. And he said, and he came up to me and he said, I have oysters packed in ice. I have Belgian chocolate. I have, and he had uh, gotten a job dishwashing that morning at the King David Hotel and had just quit in disgust halfway through the day and had raided this super fancy four-star hotel and just had a backpack full of this stuff. And I didn't even bother to tell him. I mean, what am I going to say, you know? I mean, sure, of course. <laughs> so these kinds of things, uh, and they're very private, you see. Nothing happens there except that a guy quits his job and rips off a uh, hotel, except that it is coincident with an internal state, a private musing of somebody else. And when the two things come together, the coincidence of it is absolutely excruciating. Cat uh, had a, an experience. She's not here to tell it. Uh, but uh, she went to Mexico when she was 19 and traveled all over Mexico and took LSD at a certain temple. And on the LSD trip in this place, she realized that she had been conceived there. And when she confronted her parents with it, it was so. It was so that she had been conceived there. Uh, now, of course, you can say, well, in growing up, this must have been a story told around the dinner table, and then under LSD, the child brings it out. But sometimes these things just peels reality apart. The purest proof that I've ever had that goes against the clue-finding integrative unconscious thing and really the the time wave that we've spent so much time looking at is in a sense a net to trail through life it's a coincidental engine it causes there to be more coincidences in your life and in fact a way to let coincidence in your life is to let numbers into your life uh, the schizophrenic who looks at the at the uh, license plates passing on the freeway is simply the lowest grade worshiper of numbers. But when you really let numbers into your uh, existence, coincidence runs rampant. We have talked here a little bit about the most astonishing coincidence of all, of all which is that mathematics describes nature. That's a coincidence as far as I can tell. Why should it? No philosopher that I have ever read, no mathematician has ever been able to make it make cogent sense that 
the abstract operations of the human mind should somehow map over the uh, core dynamics of nature. It's like a coincidence. Um, when I was working with the time wave, the most perfect example of uh, anticipation or disruption of ordinary flows of probability was... Um, I had this idea when I was working out the time wave, before the 2012 date was chosen and settled on, way back in the early 70s, I discovered a, an odd coincidence, which went like this. It's embedded in a whole bunch of coincidences, but it goes like this. From the date of my mother's death till the time when I met the woman who went with me to La Cherera, 64 days passed. From the time I met that woman till the actual experiment at La Cherera, 64 days passed. From thence forward, three times 64 days later was my 23rd birthday. And looking at all these coincidences, I propagated forward into time, uh, not 64-day increments, but 384-day increments. And I discovered something really interesting, which was when you went from my 23rd birthday, 384 days forward, no particular big deal. But when you went 384 days forward again, it landed on um, the winter solstice of 1973. And I thought that this was mildly interesting. And so then I looked in a naval observatory almanac, and I discovered that uh, there was a total eclipse of the sun on this solstice, which I thought was pretty weird. And that this total eclipse of the sun uh, would sweep across the Amazon, would only be visible from the Amazon basin, would be approaching totality as it swept across La Chirera, and it would, in fact, achieve totality over the city of Berlin in Brazil. Well, now, Berlin is a Portuguese word which means Bethlehem. And I began to see, I began to feel led. I began to feel as though I were being fed clues. So then I looked at the map, and you may do so as well, and you will see that the city of Berlin in Brazil, the city of, of Bethlehem, is situated in the delta of the Amazon. Well, I'm Joyce Scholar and River freak enough to know that all rivers are female, and if you're too dense to know that, certainly the Amazon River is female, because it is named the Amazon. I mean, Gaia is what it is, you know, and Amazon is a giant woman. Well, here in her vulva, in literally in the delta, and delta, you see, is this triangular the Greek letter delta is a triangle and has been a schoolboy symbol for the female genitals for 18,000 years. Uh, in the delta of the Amazon sits the city of Belim, over which on a certain winter solstice a total eclipse of the sun will appear. <coughs> and I said, you know, my goodness, this is, uh, this is the stuff of prophecy, something marvelous it must be going to happen there. And, you know, I, you must know uh, Yeats' poem, um, what's it called? The Second Coming, the one about what rough beast slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. And it is the imi an, an apocalyptic image, an image of uh, the shift of the aeon. So I had all this data, see, pointing at December 23rd, uh, 1973. And it 
but I got this same argument from people, this argument that uh, you must have known, you must have seen these uh, uh, astronomical ephemerides at some time in the past, you must have an unconscious photographic memory, the mind must be a computer at some level, and so forth and so on. But what clinched it for me was early in 1973, still... 13, 11 months before this much-anticipated moment, uh, I open the San Francisco Chronicle one morning, and it says, long-period comet headed toward Earth. And I closed the newspaper and said aloud, I know that this comet will make its closest approach to the sun on December 23rd. Then I open the paper and read it. It says, yes, it will approach Perhelion on the 22nd of December, give or take, you know, so many hours, Greenwich. And then I saw, for me, that did it. Because what it was, was a perfect proof. My wish had been granted. Because you see, no human being on earth knew that this comet existed or had ever known because it was a long period comet. It had never in historical times been in the skies of Earth. When I had focused in on this date using all these clues, it was absolutely in the value dark dimension. You, it was not in the collective unconscious unless the collective unconscious anticipates the future. And if that's the case, then there's no way to contaminate any experiment from influence. So, uh, you know, the, the mushroom was willing enough to provide for my edification this thing. Well, but then see what happens. You may remember this comet. It was the comet Cohote. And it was an excuse for all kinds of falderol. I mean, uh, harmonic convergence, eat your heart out. Uh, this was uh, a much bigger deal. And yet this comet, which physically should have blossomed out into the most spectacular comet of all human history, was a dud. And once again, you know, prophets ate it right and left. And uh, booksellers were left with vast unsold uh, inventory. So, uh, to me, it's like play. It's like a joke. It's like if you can't, if that doesn't seem like a joke to you, then you don't have a sense of humor. You know, it's not going to hand over your alchemical gold, because after all, why should it? Who are we to be the recipients of alchemical gold? But it does tease, and it does play. And I think if you're playful enough, you can coax it into being your playmate. And perhaps in these boundary-dissolved states, this is what's ha what happens. Uh, I've told the story about uh, how in the Amazon, when all this stuff was breaking loose, I went through this period where uh, very calmly and deeply and without having any need to tell anyone, I thought, I came to the opinion that I was, like, enlightened. And it was this very low-key thing. It was all about appropriate behavior. This was the cognitive hallucination that I was having. It was about appropriate behavior. And I had this idea there's an appropriate way to do everything. And if you do it the appropriate way, no energy will be lost. And so you become like super conducting. You become like some kind of super Tai Chi character where you just do things so niftily that there's no problem, whether it's plucking a flower or moving a boulder. And I was told, when you think, sit on the ground. This was There were all these teachings, and they were very simple. They were things like, sit on the ground, stupid, and, uh, you know, use your fingers. That was a big teaching. Use your fingers. <laughs> so one of the things I was into was how you wash the pot. We had one pot. It was this little enamel pot. 
and we would bake it over a fire and we baked beans and we baked rice and all these terrible things that would get scum on the bottom. And so it was a big deal about drawing lots for who washed the pot. Well, I discovered in my enlightened state that we had been doing it all wrong and that if you would go down to the water with the pot and and take sand and pat it very, very lightly in the bottom and then say, please, <laughs> that then all you had to do was pour water into the pot and swish it around and empty it like that. And then when you looked in, it would be like Drano, you know, it would just be <laughs> blinding white. <laughs> And I did this several times, and I thought, how appropriate a miracle this is. This is a real miracle. I mean, this is just simple stuff. It's totally here and now. It's absolutely Taoist. It's completely, you know, on and on. Uh, so then I had a critic in our crowd, and so I thought that I would enlighten the critic by a wordless demonstration of my obvious command of the howling Tao. So I invited the critic to in accompany me to the river. And, uh, and I said, and now notice that I pick up the sand, I pat it into the bottom, I'm not agitating it. I look into the sky and I say, please... And then I put water in it, and I swish it around. Voila! I said, is something supposed to happen? <laughs> and I look, and the crud adheres. <laughs> and then this person says, you know, I pity you. <laughs> and I would pity you more, but you alarm me. <laughs> This was the sequela to the to the thing with the dancing butterflies, which was at the same time and the same thing, which is in my enlightened state, totally master of the Tao, I would go into the woods and I would hold out my hands, my outstretched hands like this. And butterflies that I had hunted relentlessly for months with a 16-foot extendable Japanese killing machine that uh, was my tool in trade, these canopy butterflies would come down and land on, the, on my hands and strut and show their iridescence and tears of joy would stream down my face and I would kneel down and they would all line up in front of me and, and then I would weep more. But, you know, how much cathartic weeping and joy of this sort can you contain? So there would be this little nub in the experience which would begin to grow stronger, which was all about this proves that... I'm on to something. Nobody could look at this and not realize. <laughs> said, I must show someone. And by the, and the critic had not spoken to me since the pot washing incident, <laughs> but was very, you know, on me. So then I went back to camp and I said, let's just take a walk down the trail. Maybe we can work out these differences, thinking that I wouldn't even mention it. I would just sort of, as I was consoling them, put out my hand and, and uh, you know, butterflies would drop from the trees. They would realize the error of their ways, so forth and so on. Well, of course, you know, that didn't happen. So then I said, well, maybe I'm being too humble here. I should at least make a commitment to the thing. So I said, stand here and watch. And I raised up my hands to call the insects of the jungle to me. And then the line was delivered the second time, you know. I pity you. And you are, you're not, you're, were, you know. <laughs> you're. <clears throat> this is all true. It is true that the butterflies danced on the back of my hand. Well, so what do you, what is one to conclude from this? Well, I think what you have to conclude is that ego is the absolute impediment to Tao. 
and that if you care what other people think, if you care how it's going to impact on your reputation, if you care, if you have any of these um, lesser concerns, this this power, this radiance, this dimension of authenticity can't approach you, you know? And we all have it. And I'm sure I have it more than most people. And yet even I am able to let down into these places where the world works magic, you know? And I think uh, women and intuitive men and... Uh, uh, people who aren't quite as analytical as as I may be are able to uh, to do it much more, and that is the real proof. You can talk about be here now till you're blue in the face, you know. But the real proof is when nature responds like that. Well, no, I don't mean caring about others. I mean that if you are I guess the, the sin is pride. The sin is pride. If it thrills you that you're enlightened, or if you're glad you beat out your competition, or if you want to display your uh, accomplishment, then it's ruined, you know? It can only be, it has to be held so very lightly, so very lightly. It cannot be shared in a sense. About sitting on the beach. It always happens when you're alone because then you get no credit. You see, it's no credit to you and you shouldn't get any credit. But sitting on a, a beach, I can't even remember the substance, but uh, something like this. Or maybe something like this. I'm not sure. But sitting on a beach, meditating, holding my hands like this, and in the middle of the meditation, I become aware of something like a bug or, or something is on my hand and it's like tickling me. And so I ignore it and then, you know, and then I come back to it and then it feels fairly substantial. Maybe I should check this out. So then finally I open my eyes and I look down, and there's a crab. And the crab is cleaning my fingernails. <laughs> and the crab cleans all of my fingernails, and then runs across my lap and cleans all of the fingernails <laughs> on the other hand. Well, what this is, is just sitting still. And letting nature be what it wants to be and letting it manifest its intentionality. We tear through and bust up and smash apart. And then we say, well, that was a nice hike in the woods, <laughs> you know. And uh, always, if you will go into the forest and sit down, and it's about finding the time, finding the time of the place. And in the time of the place, the magic is coming and going in a way that if you're moving faster or slower, it, it just it just isn't there. And I've often had experiences that I felt that were connected with psychedelics, but the main function of the psychedelic was to get me to be still for a long time. Cat had a wonderful experience on a Mexican... Uh, pyramid she was exploring it she took lsd or something and fell asleep and when she woke up the tree she had been sleeping in that she had been staring into the branches before she fell asleep and so had a very clear picture of it when she awakened a very large snake had shed its skin directly above her in the branches of the trees well, you know, part of this is the doorway into coincidence, but part of it is uh, uh, magical attunement with what wants to be. This is what I think Kay must have been indicating. This is not language. This is communication. This is, you know, the breath of the Tao. 
And everything that we say betrays this. So feng shui, geomancy, an elaborate theory about energy flowing through the earth. As a verbal model, to me, quite unconvincing. As a set of feelings about the world, as a sense of the intentionality of place, incontrovertibly true. Well, it's funny, uh, again, to mention Jung. Um, he had this concept which he called synchronicity, which is uh, the apparent coincidence of a mental state with an event in the exterior world. And what I mean by that is you're walking along the street thinking about Mr. Fishman, to whom you owe money, and suddenly there's a fish right on the street in front of you. Uh, this is called a synchronicity. And Jung felt that there was a kind of a, what he called a causal connectedness, and that this was how the unconscious attempted to communicate uh, by by juxtaposing thoughts with exterior events that seem related to them in some magical way. And uh, if you're, you know, sometimes synchronicity is one or two a week and we just sort of notice it and pass on, but they can build. And when we're going through spiritual crises or when we're intoxicated on psychedelic drugs, for example, these synchronicities can multiply until the whole uh, exterior world seems to be trying uh, to communicate something to you. And um, it's alarming to ordinary psychiatrists because they call it delusions of grandeur. Mm -hmm. The patient thinks the world is trying to communicate with him. But having been on the inside of this, I can tell you, it's very powerful, and a lot of Chinese philosophical thinking has been based on, on recognizing this synchrony, this resonance between mind and nature at critical times. And so as you see this fish reminding you of the man who owes, owes you money, flopping on the ground, uh, gasping and dying out of the water, do you, do you take pleasure? Well, I had a dead fish in my image, so it wasn't an issue for me. It, it didn't flop. All right. No, it didn't flop. In fact, it was quite light. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, east of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning with Terrence McKenna. Where are you, please? Now, this is Bill in Wisconsin. Bill, you're going to have to yell at us. Go okay, ahead. Okay, how's that? Better. Um, Terrence, we were talking, you were talking a little bit about the fish on the sidewalk. Right. And... I uh, have had experience with LSD. I was a part of an experiment in the 1970s or mid-70s, and we were allowed to inject um, three bottles of Sandoz uh, LSD, 100 micrograms each at the same time, so 300 micrograms IV. And uh, since that time, I've had experiences, oh, hundreds of experiences, similar to the fish on the sidewalk. Um, I'll give you just one quick one. And I want to take it one step further and ask you this question. Um, on the way to the motor vehicle department, uh, I borrowed $35 from my girlfriend to get my motorcycle back in the 70s. And I said, wouldn't it be something, you know, to see an interesting plate come up? Well, it came up, UIO35. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect example. Now, what's your question? Well... To take the fish story one step further, and I've found it hundreds of times since then, that not only does it reflect what you're thinking or whatever, but reality seems to actually change as you walk, hmm. change as you think. Yes, well now I would say that this is a clue to the fact that the story you've been told by science and physics and chemistry and all that is simply... That you are not, you're a person in a story. It, because all such things don't go on in the world of ordinary probability and ordinary physics. Have and that. so it's like a certain point in your, the evolution of your understanding where you realize that physics and chemistry and all that 
is not what it's about, that you're inside the story. And I think the the juice in that insight is that you can then try and figure out whose story is it. In other words, mm. is it your story, or do you exist in this story to open the door for somebody on page 220, and is that it? Uh, and then, of course, the ultimate aspiration to become the author of the story. Imagine if... I you... am the author at times, okay? Yeah, other, other, at other, other, times. other times, you're nothing but a bit player. That's it. <laughs> That's right, and the, the trick is to get some handle on that those moments when you are the author. I've been working at it. All right. Um, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much.